our ophthalmologist or injector in chief, as she may be, um, Dr. Julia Haller, who will be introducing our final speaker of the afternoon. Thank you so much, Sunir. This is uh, a real pleasure for me, a special pleasure. Uh, first of all, because Dr. Irving Leopold was the, the first ophthalmologist in chief at Wills in the early 1960s. Uh, and one of the few people to hold as many leadership roles in ophthalmology and to, as a clinician scientist and inventor, uh, pharmacologist, uh, to make so many contributions. He served at Wills. He was chief of ophthalmology and, and chair at Mount Sinai, uh, went out to UC Irvine where he teamed with the young Gavin Herbert to start a little company called Allergan. <laughs> and, um, and made, and made history in so many ways. There's a cute story his son told uh, in one of the obituaries that I read last week uh, that he, he loved to go, he was, he was funny and he was kind and he loved going to dinner in Philadelphia and at one restaurant the waiter kept telling him how much he loved his suit. So a little bit later after hearing this three or four times, uh, Dr. Leopold got up and went to the bathroom, took off his suit, came out and gave it to the waiter and left the restaurant in his shirt and with the um, tablecloth wrapped around him. <laughs> at, at the, which is, you might not think that that was the kind of guy he was. That was, an, uh, that was a wonderful story that I think gave you a little insight into his character over and above being such a distinguished gentleman. Our Leopold lecturer is somebody very, very special. And um, I had the great serendipitous good fortune of being in San Diego at the time of the ASCRIS meeting last year, the 2019 ASCRIS meeting. And also serendipitously, my medical school classmate, Dave Chang, who's very involved in the program committee there, sent me a text because they were giving a award to Dr. Tigerson. Uh, and our classmate from medical school, Marcus Tigerson, was going to accept the award for his grandfather, who was being given the award posthumously. So I thought, great, ran over to the, uh, you know, usually we retina people don't hang out, you know, at meetings with all the interior segment folks, but you have this huge crowd, a lot of our alumni in front, uh, Eric Donnefeld was there and things like that, um, got back to the green room and watched and um, had the incredible opportunity of seeing another of our alums, Tom Samuelson, for, get up and, and as his purview as president, invite this very, very special speaker. In fact, he said it was the highlight of his career to have invited this speaker. And told the story about his fondness for Ken Burns documentaries. I, does, I'm a Ken Burns documentary fan too, I don't know who else is. And he told about watching the Vietnam, the recent Vietnam Ken Burns documentary, and being absolutely fascinated with it, and discovering this incredibly articulate, humble, and inspiring physician who had been the only prisoner of war, a physician prisoner of war in Vietnam. Being so impressed with him, as the video clips ran through the documentary, and then, as he sat and watched all of the credits roll, discovering that this man had gone on to become an ophthalmologist uh, and, and after, after he came home and um, was in practice in Delray, Florida. So he tracked him down. I, you know, people use the word discovered. It always seems funny to me when we you know people are discovered because obviously they've been there all, all this time and, and uh, had had a brilliant career in, in uh, Delray, wonderful career. And um, up gets Dr. Kushner uh, after the video clips were shown. And I, I'm going to show those too. We'll, we'll see them right now, the, the clips from the documentary that Ascaris assembled. Um, and as Dr. Kushner spoke, I found myself tearing up. You looked around the audience, everybody was tearing up. And I've never been to a professional meeting where after the speaker finished, the entire crowd rose as one, clapping and cheering with tears rolling down their cheeks. So a little bit later, Dr. Kushner comes back to the green room where I had already texted Sunir <laughs> to see if we had an open spot in March, pounced on him, <laughs> and asked him if he could possibly come to Philadelphia because I knew this was something that would be an incredible experience for all of us here. And we're also videoing it, so 
to the extent the coronavirus has taken its toll, we, we hope to be able to share this with a lot more of the, of, of the Will's Eye family. Uh, so that's my story. Uh, oh, and, and then Dr. Kushner said he had been in Vietnam at the same time Jerry Shields had been, and they had connected afterwards. Jerry was in Da Nang, I think. Um, and uh, so yet another connection, and, and they connected over the years. Jerry had visited at, at his home in Florida. So once more, it's such a, such a very small world with only one or two degrees of separation. Without further ado, and with all credit to uh, the American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery, I'm going to play their video as my introduction to our wonderful Leopold lectureship, Dying is Easy, Living is the Difficult Thing, will be the title. Captain Hal Kushner was a 26-year-old recent graduate of medical school from Danville, Virginia. The father of a three-year-old girl with another baby on the way. He had volunteered to serve in Vietnam and became a flight surgeon with the 1st Air Cavalry. We had terrible weather that night. And it was dark and it was rainy and it was windy. As we were flying, I saw that we had drifted west of the highway and I knew that was wrong. In the fog and rain, Kushner's helicopter slammed into a mountain. And the next thing I knew, I was hanging upside down in a burning helicopter. Major Porcello was dead. I just jumped away from the helicopter and it just went whoosh, and it just burned up. There was an M60 machine gun on the helicopter and the rounds were cooking off and it was exploding. And one or several of the rounds went through my shoulder, my left shoulder. On the ground, I saw Warrant Officer Bedworth and he was hurt very badly. I took some branches and splinted his leg. So the rule is you wait with the aircraft until you get rescued. And we just sat there. So we waited one day, we waited two days. We had no food or water. On the morning of the third day, Bedworth died. And he just slipped away. And it was very, very sad. And this Vietnamese officer came to me and he spoke English and it was the first real English speaker that I had seen. And he had a little reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, battery powered tape recorder. And he asked me to make a message to my family to let them know that I was safe and I could do that if I would make a statement against the war. And I, t I told him with great bravado that I would rather die than make a statement against my country. And he said to me, uh, you will find dying is very easy. Living will be the difficult thing. Living is the difficult thing. Thirteen Americans would die during Captain Hal Kushner's time in jungle prison camps in South Vietnam. He was a doctor, but had no medications no antibiotics or saline solution with which to treat his comrades. All he could do was bury each in a bamboo coffin and make sure the spot was marked with a heap of stones daubed with mercurochrome. We had nothing to eat, and I thought that I was just going insane. Richard Nixon spoke to the nation. 28 years after the United States first became involved in Vietnam, it was finally getting out. I have asked for this radio and television time tonight for the purpose of announcing that we today have concluded an agreement to end the war and bring peace with honor in Vietnam and in Southeast Asia. A ceasefire internationally supervised will begin at 7 p.m. this Saturday, January 27, Washington time. Within 60 days from this Saturday, all Americans held prisoners of war throughout Indochina 
will be released. American prisoners of war, 591 of them, were to be released in batches of 40. Those who had been in captivity the longest were to come home first. Hal Kushner's turn came in mid-March. Oh, beautiful, far heroes proved in liberating strife. And they, then they called their name. And I walked out in the sunlight. And the first thing I saw was a girl in a miniskirt. She was a reporter for one of the news organizations. I'd never seen a real live miniskirt. And, mercy more than life. and there was a table with the Vietnamese and American authorities on one side, and there was a brigadier general, Air Force general in Class A uniform. And he looked magnificent. And I looked at him, and he had breadth. He had thickness that we didn't have. And his hair was, he had on a garrison cap, and his hair was plump and moist. And our hair was like straw, you know, it was dry, and we were skinny. <clears throat> and I went out and I saluted, which was a courtesy that had been denied us for so many years. And he saluted me and he, I shook hands with him and he hugged me, he actually hugged me. And he said, welcome home, Major. We're glad to see you, doctor. And the tears were streaming down his cheeks. And it was just a, a powerful moment. My purple man, majesty. And then this liaison officer, they called it, came out and got me and escorted me on this C-141, it was this beautiful white airplane with a flag. <sighs> An American flag on the tail. And USAF. You know, God done shed his grace on thee. And they had these real cute flight nurses on there. They were all tall and blonde and you know, they, they were just gorgeous and we got on this thing and, and she said this nurse uh, we sat in these seats and she said we have anything you want you know do you, what do you want and I, I wanted a coke with crushed ice and some chewing gum we flew to valley forge pennsylvania and i came off the helicopter and i saw my wife and my daughter who I hadn't seen since she was two and a half, and she was born in 1963. So she was 10 years old. And my son, who I had never seen, the week before his fifth birthday. And he had a little tie and a little coat. And my mom and dad. And my mother was just overcome with emotion. And I just, uh, it was just an incomprehensible moment. And we hugged everybody and my little boy had a flag, American flag. Ladies and gentlemen, a true American hero and our Leopold lecture, Dr. Hal Kushner. I was going to tell the story about Oh, you were? Yeah. <laughs> sorry. We need to get together. Yeah, we can. Sorry, that's my bad. You can tell again. Okay, thank you. Sunir told me I had 45 minutes, and I didn't realize we would have this long introduction. And Dr. Haller stole my story about Leopold. So um, if you will indulge me. First of all, I don't have any slides, it's just me talking. There's not gonna be any wave mechanics, no quantum mechanics, no neuroanatomy, no special or general theories of relativity, no photochemistry, no organic. Uh, there will be a little ophthalmology, so just relax. 
uh, and we will give this talk without slides. The projector can't break. And then we'll roll into happy hour. And uh, it's been a long day, and we'll all be ready for a drink. I'm sure that I win the distance prize because I came from Antarctica. And uh, my wife, Gail, who was there, was there with me. Uh, and we came back on Saturday night. And uh, I had to be in Gettysburg yesterday and the day before for a board meeting. So I'm just thrilled and honored to speak at this event, at this place. This is the absolute pinnacle of ophthalmology. Um, and I come from very close to Bascom Palmer, and I can say that. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Haller, I've been seeing her beautiful picture in all these magazines and everything. <laughs> and um, I practice in Daytona Beach. Delray Beach is a very affluent community. <laughs> I practice on the poor side of Florida. In fact, we're having bike week now. And if you want to go, there are 400,000 motorcyclists down there right now. Wow. So, but I'm thrilled to be here with this, with the great tradition of wills from 1832 to treat the blind, the lame, and the indigent. And to lecture at a, a name lecture for one of the real titans of ophthalmology, Dr. Irving Leopold. I actually heard him speak. We had a visiting professor program at my residency. He was at uh, UCAL at Irvine then, came to our residency and he spoke on pharmacology and I have his little green book on pharmacology in my library at home. He was a Philadelphian born and bred, long and storied career. And during World War II, he worked on the, uh, for the military for antidotes to chemical eye injuries, as you may know. And as a result of that, he developed phospholine iodide which some of us really old timers used to use for accommodative strabismus and glaucoma, aphakic glaucoma. At the time of his death, he was still a consultant to Army Medical Research, and he was a wonderful meld of clinician, surgeon, and researcher with a great sense of humor, and he knew everything about baseball, apparently, and Dr. Haller stole my story about the tablecloth, and that was in Bookbinder's restaurant. In Bookbinder's? That's what they said, yes. <laughs> So he was, uh, he was past chairman of the American Board of Ophthalmology and ARVO, and he was the chairman of the ophthalmology department at Mount Sinai, as she said, and at University of California at Irvine and at the University of Pennsylvania. And of course, he, he joined the Will staff in 1946, and he was attending surgeon, director of research, and the first ophthalmologist in chief here, the first one, from 1961 to 64. He edited many journals, was widely awarded, and got the big three medals, the Hal Friedenwald and the Verhoff medals, and he gave many named lectures, including the Jackson Lecture and the inaugural Leopold Lecture in 1987, Ophthalmology Through the Retrospectroscope. He was a truly remarkable man, and he died in 1993 at age 78 one year younger than I am now, which reminds me that I am going to make a proactive announcement now. I got this shirt back from the laundry, and when I sent it, it fit me, and now it is two sizes too small, so if I fall out on the stage, don't call 911, just unbutton my shirt collar. <laughs> because I, I think I have bilateral carotid occlusive disease now. Now, there have been 33 Leopold lecturers, and the list is a venerable who's who of ophthalmology illuminati. And it is certainly intimidating to a small town general ophthalmologist as I am. So I thought I would just sing a couple of tunes and then we could roll into happy hour. <laughs> Actually, if you will indulge me, I have looked through my own retrospectroscope. This is my 43rd year as a board certified ophthalmologist and my 54th year as a licensed certified MD. My practice has just been a blessing for me. I was trained just as in intracapsular surgery, just as the microscope came in and became standard. We did retinal detachments by the Scapin's technique 
with scleral dissection and diathermy, and it took four hours. You remember those days. And when I learned cryo and sponges, I mean, it was like a revelation from God. And we finally got a retinal group in Orlando, which is about 60 miles away, in the mid-1980s. And we did corneal transplants before MK Media even and Optisol. So we used to have to harvest the eyes from cadavers and then stay up all night and do the transplant in the operating room with a staff that wasn't familiar with where the equipment was or anything, and it was awful. And when we got the MK Media, that was just wonderful. Uh, my practice, I never did refractions or contacts except on children that I operated on. But I did everything else. I did neuro, glaucoma, pediatrics, strabismus, and plastics. And for 40 years, I screened preemies in our NICU. I had Dr. Tasman's little book. So the culture, and I'm still practicing two days a week. I gave up surgery when I was 75. Uh, the culture and focus of our specialty has changed so much. When I trained trachoma and onchocerciasis, were the leading causes of world blindness with cataracts, diabetes, macular degeneration, glaucoma. And now it seems from reading my little ophthalmology newspapers, presbyopia is the scourge of mankind. <laughs> In my practice, I have been honored to operate on four generations of two different families, and I have had five couples that I helped celebrate their 75th wedding anniversaries. I literally don't do anything the way I was trained. And I've seen such great advances, as Lawton Smith used to say, they were atomic, and it's just overwhelming. And I started practicing before the FTC changed the rules about advertising of the learned professions. So I've never advertised, I've never co-managed, and I guess I've been successful. I'm so grateful to ophthalmology, and I'm so fortunate I chose this specialty. I've done missions all over the world. I think I've done 12 missions. Been to Africa twice, India three times, Turkey, Peru. And it has been so fulfilling for me to help people and yet to enhance my understanding of how lucky we are in this country. I had a lot of training in OBGYN and in orthopedics, and I chose ophthalmology not because it started with O, but it has been one of the great choices of my life, and standing here is one of the great honors of my life. Before I was an ophthalmologist, I was a soldier, and I grew up in, in a time of intense national patriotism during World War II. I'm a Pearl Harbor survivor. My dad was a captain in the Army Air Corps at Hickam, Air, Hickam Field, close by Pearl Harbor when the Japanese bombed on 7 December 1941. I was just a baby. But our family was evacuated. My dad went to war in the Pacific. He returned seriously wounded in 11 months. He was in the hospital stateside for two months. Then he formed up with an infantry division and went to Europe in 1944 for the duration of the war. The military is a family business. And 23 years after Pearl Harbor, I joined the Army as a medical student in 1964. And like the 22 million other living veterans, 10% of whom are women, I pledged my life to defend our country and its principles. And the, <clears throat> excuse me, the very first rule of the military code of conduct, I am an American fighting in the forces which guard my country and its way of life, and I will defend those forces with my life. There is no clearer declarative statement, nor an oath more serious. I interned in the hospital of my birth, Tripler, in Hawaii, military hospital. In the second month of my internship, wounded GIs and Marines started pouring into this hospital. It was 650 beds. And I learned the truth of that eccentric statement made by an English physician about the Crimean War. How wide and varied is the experience of the battlefield, and how fertile the blood of young warriors in raising good surgeons. We discharged all the dependents, or we placed them in civilian facilities, and we filled the hospital with wounded. And when it was filled, 
they came down and they built tents on the grounds and we filled those. Most, most of these uh, boys had limb and chest wounds and they came from the airport still filthy in their battle dress with tags on them describing their treatments in the field. I was moved to orthopedics and I worked there for eight months, day and night, during the, exactly the same operation, debridement and delayed closure. We hung pin and strep, we debrided the wounds, we set the fractures, we passed wires through the wounds, and if it didn't suppurate in seven days, we closed the wires. Wow. That was what we did. So after eight months of this, I asked my chief to transfer me. I said, Jesus, Colonel, this is my internship. So he sent me over to the chest service, and for the last two months of my internship, I inserted and removed chest tubes. We know that many medical innovations come from the necessity of the battlefield. Blood banking, burn therapy, antibiotics, orthopedic appliances are just a few. I learned that firsthand, but I learned a lot more about soldiering and leadership and sacrifice. And I volunteered to go to Vietnam after that experience. And I was interested in aviation, so I trained and became a flight surgeon. I was married, as you saw on the tape. A lot of what I was going to say was on the tape. And I was married with a three-year-old girl who is 56, sitting there now. And she was barely potty trained when I deployed in August of 1967. Remember that, fix that date, August 1967. And I replaced a young doctor, Carl Shinep. Memphis, Tennessee, who was killed in action a month before I got there. In October, two months after I got there, I was informed that my wife was pregnant with our second child with an EDC in 19, April of 1968. For over five years, I didn't know what happened. Was it healthy? Was it born? Was it a boy? Was it a girl? And I didn't meet my son, Michael, who will be 52 next month until a week before his fifth birthday. In Vietnam, I was the squadron flight surgeon for a very famous unit, the mighty 1st Squadron, 9th Cavalry. And if you went to the Army-Navy game in Philadelphia or saw it on TV in December, the Army wore jerseys with the cross saber, which I am wearing now, insignia of the 1st Squadron, 9th Cavalry. We were involved in daily combat. Ours was the unit I see some gray hair here. You may remember the 1979 film, Apocalypse Now. Ours was the unit featured in that film. And my commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Bob Nevins, was the model for Robert Duvall's character. Colonel Nevins, a true warrior and a dear friend who I had the honor and privilege of eulogizing at his funeral in Otumwa, Iowa in 2008, never said, oh, how I love the smell of napalm in the morning. <laughs> but he certainly flew his helicopter in combat wearing a black Stetson hat rather than a flight helmet and sporting a bright yellow scarf. I had 17 combat medics in my squadron. 13, 13 were killed in action or wounded badly enough to be evacuated from the theater. Our helicopters returned from action with those gray-green body bags with corpses inside frequently with seriously wounded GIs or Vietnamese POWs, who we treated and stabilized and evacuated if required. We lived on an LZ, a landing zone, a muddy landing zone. It was carved out of the jungle with bugs and snakes and stifling heat and cold rain, and we were mortared frequently. And we took quinine for malaria, we had halogen tablets to purify the water in our canteens, and we had Kool-Aid from home to disguise the taste of the iodine. We ate sea rations in the field. And my favorite was the, the fruit cocktail. <laughs> and all the little cases of seas had those little cigarette packs with four cigarettes in the pack and with a little baby roll of toilet paper. And I know Jerry Shields knows exactly what I'm talking about because he was up with the Marines at Da Nang and they had the same thing. And those were commodities we sorely missed, cigarettes and toilet paper as prisoners of war. That's politically incorrect, I guess. I had troopers spread out over 350 miles of Vietnam, so I did a lot of flying. And I thought we had it pretty rough. And then on the night of 30 November 1967 in a driving rainstorm, in pitch darkness, our helicopter crashed over enemy territory. 
I regained consciousness, as I said on the film, in a burning helicopter. And I unbuckled my seat belt and I literally fell out of the helicopter and my helmet was plugged into the commo system and I almost broke my neck because the airplane was completely inverted. The pilot was killed on impact and the co-pilot was seriously injured. His tibia, his right tibia, was sticking through the nylon of his jungle boot. The crew chief was unconscious but thrown clear. I tried to free the pilot. I couldn't tell whether he was dead or not, and he had a knife on the right side of his belt, and I took his knife and tried to cut his seat belt, but it got too hot, and I couldn't do it, and I jumped from the helicopter with the knife in my hand, and the top chopper just burned up. It was a big whoosh like that. And only then did I realize that my left collarbone was broken, my left radius and ulna were fractured. I had no glasses, I had second degree burns, facial lacerations, and I had lost a bunch of teeth. As the airplane burned up with all the supplies, the M60 machine gun cooked off rounds and I got hit in the left torso. So, with that knife that I had in my hand, I cut some tree branches and I splinted the co-pilot's leg with two uh, army belts and branches. And the next day at first light, the crew chief, who was apparently unhurt, we sent for help. We thought we knew where we were. He never returned. And later, much later, six years later, I learned that he had been shot dead and found submerged in a rice paddy about 10 miles from the crash site. So we stayed with the aircraft, three long rainy days and nights. We had nothing but rainwater, and the co-pilot, who was a very brave young warrant officer from a very affluent family in New Haven, Connecticut, died on the third day, uncomplaining in great pain. Two December 1967, he died. I then left the aircraft, and the weather was terrible, and I made it about 10 miles and I saw a peasant in a field, and he, uh, he saw that I was in bad shape, and he gave me a can of milk. He took me to a hooch, gave me a can of milk, and then he led a squad of 14 Viet Cong enemy to me as I was eating the milk. And I had um, bound my left arm to my body with uh, my belt in a modified Velpo dressing because my collarbone was broken and my radius and ulna were broken. And the squad leader of this group said, surrender, no kill, surrender, no kill in English. And he put both his hands up. And I put my right hand up, and he shot me at point blank range with a US Army carbine right through the left shoulder. So they tied me tightly in a duck wing position with, like this, with commo wire. They took my boots, and that began my five and a half years as a prisoner of war. They tore up my Geneva Convention card, white with a red cross, which identified me as a medic, medical personnel. They took my dog tags, and they took all my possessions, including a very precious medallion with a St. Christopher's on one side, Carol, and a Star of David on the other, which my dad had given me. And <clears throat> my unit found the crash site the next day, the fourth day after the crash, and they noted that the co-pilot had been, quote, professionally splinted, close quote, and so they assumed that I was not dead and not critically injured. Then the enemy marched me, tied barefoot and with a silver dollar size hole in my shoulder through and through to a cave until nightfall. And they tied me to a plank and beat me with a bamboo stick and said I was not entitled to the Geneva Convention. No POW, no POW, criminal, criminal, they shouted at me. And that uh, first 30 of the 1,932 days of my captivity involved marching bound and barefoot to our first camp. We travel mostly at night, always west, always going higher and higher in the mountains. We slept in caves in the daytime. And after about a week, my wound was full of maggots and festered, and I had fever, and I was sick. And along the way, I saw they had these men, women, and children caged in bamboo cages in their own filth. 
They took me to what I suppose was a hospital, an open-air hospital. There were wounded lying about in hammocks. And this female medic, Vietnamese medic, took me and she had me lie down on a log, a split log. And she gave me a bamboo stick to bite on. And then she heated up an AK-47 cleaning rod in a fire until it was red hot. And then she cauterized my through and through wound, killed the maggots, cauterized it. It took 11 months to heal. I have a scar like that now. And I ended up having to have orthopedic surgery twice on it. Um, she gave me a single aspirin tablet. And I thought, what else can they do to me? And I was to find out. My feet were lacerated and bleeding. Every step hurt. We walked on rice paddies at night, these dikes that were about 8 inches to 12 inches wide. And I was tied up. And the Vietnamese had these little homemade cigarette lighters, and they could spark a few sparks, and they could see a few steps ahead. I couldn't see anything. I had no glasses. And I would fall off the dike into the paddy, and they would pull me up by my bonds. And it was rough. A few days after the hospital, we stopped at another camp, and they put me in a dark hut with an, uh, an emaciated Asian man who spoke a language that was not Vietnamese. He coughed constantly. It was pitch dark in there with no latrine. They gave us no food for 24 hours, and I thought that he might have TB, and they were trying to scare me with germ warfare. And after a day and a night, the uh, this Vietnamese officer came, as you saw on the tape, had a real uniform on with red tabs, and I learned out later he was a captain, and he took me out, and they had this little makeshift table, and he gave me a cup of tea and a cigarette, and he said that I could make a message to my family to let them know that I was alive if I would show progress by condemning the war, and I told him I would rather die than make a statement against my country. <clears throat> And he said those profound words, you will find that dying is very easy and living, living will be the difficult thing. And there was no other pressure and he went away. And the next day in a driving rainstorm, always going higher, we went uh, to the first camp. It was very hard. We traversed high mountains, had to use ropes. I was weak and sick. And during that whole 30-day march, there was one good thing that happened to me. We stopped at a camp for the day, and this old man came up, and my fatigue jacket was stiff with blood and pus and dirt, and he tried to take it from me, and I thought he wanted it as a souvenir, and I resisted, and the guard came up at gunpoint and made me give it to him, and he actually took it to a stream, and he washed it, and he dried it over a charcoal fire, he brought it back to me, and then he took a cigarette, and he burned the leeches, I had a million leeches on my legs. And it was an island of kindness in a sea of cruelty, and I will never forget him. So finally, I arrived at my first American camp. You know, I had expected Stalag 17 with searchlights and dogs and a hospital I could work in, Red Cross packages, mail privileges. What I found was a muddy clearing under triple canopy jungle with four of the poorest, most desperate American creatures you can imagine. They were filthy and frail. They were barefoot in ragged black pajamas with matted hair and beards and rotten teeth. And they told me an American officer had died three months before. And his story is horrendous. Uh, I don't have time to tell it. Although we moved the camp frequently within one to two days march, 20 to 40 miles. That was mountainous, triple canopy jungle was my home for the next three and a half years. Our ration was two to three cups, coffee cups of rice a day, which we divided and cooked. And it was not Uncle Ben's nice white rice. It was this mountain red rice that had been cached by the Viet Minh 20 years before. And it was shot full of rat feces and weevils and stones. In the four-month rainy season, the ration was cut by one-third. And for the first two years, until Ho Chi Minh died, we had no shoes, no clothes, no blankets, no soap, no toothpaste, no tobacco, no medicine, no nothing. And it was cold. It was in the mountains. We were beaten, shackled, and starved. Half of us died. 
10 Americans died. Three of five West German nurses, two females and one male, who were there working for a neutral organization, the Knights of Malta, probably mistakenly captured because they were Caucasians, died. 13 deaths. And the hardest part for me was watching strong men give up, waste away, and die, and then burying their poor starved corpses. 10 very fine American soldiers and United States Marines died in my arms. <clears throat> One was executed in an abortive escape attempt. After they recaptured him, they sh brought him back and shot him in front of us. And one was beaten near to death and died three weeks later. When a man died, we made coffins of bamboo. We dug his grave. We marked his grave. I eulogized them. We marked the grave with rocks and bamboo. <clears throat> and I can report to you that every single one of them has been repatriated. And the last was... Lance Corporal Dennis Hammond, Detroit, Michigan, who died January 1970, and he was repatriated in 2004, 34 years after he died. <clears throat> and now they lie in the shadow of their families, in the soil of their country, where they belong. So we were, uh, excuse me, we were subjected to intense indoctrination. We had these communist meetings, criticizing meetings. They hung these big banners in the jungle. We had uh, tables and chairs and we sat. And uh, one of the banners said, freedom of speech is necessary in the debate. And when I said that Ho Chi Minh was a puppet of Mao Tse Tung, I found out it really wasn't necessary in the debate. They pulled me out and beat the hell out of me and I couldn't go back in, I didn't get fed for a day and a half. So uh, that was, we were promised release if we made progress. And then I was promised higher rations if I worked in a Vietnamese hospital. I refused, I stayed with my own men, I took my chances. <clears throat> Our captors tried to separate us by race and indoctrinate us differently. They gave up on that quickly. We were Americans and we stuck together. We slept on one bamboo pallet and the pallet had from five to 20 men on it, depending on how many people were captured at that time and how many were alive. And we were sick with malaria and dysentery and jungle diseases, parasites, and men vomited and they defecated on the pallet. And we nursed and we cleaned each other and we cared for each other, we took care of each other. On our holidays, we sang patriotic songs quietly so our captors couldn't hear. We had one book for a while, a Catholic missile that was issued by the United States Marine Corps. And the Vietnamese had torn the first two pages out. First page had a picture of the American flag, and page two was the first stanza of the Star Spangled Banner. We did slave labor. We carried wood and rice and elephant grass, and we dug bomb shelters. And there are lots of stories. In the fall of 1968, five men died within two months. We needed nutrition and medicine. Our camp was just a muddy morass with piles of human excrement. We had dysentery and malaria, and we were starving. So we decided to kill the camp commander's cat and eat it. He had a cat. So the cat wandered down to our compound in the night. We took it. We killed it. We had a rusty razor blade. We skinned it. Somebody was supposed to bury the head and the paws, and the guard saw our contraband fire about 3 a.m. We were boiling the cat. He came down and he said, uh, what's going on? And we said we had killed a weasel by throwing a rock, but he saw one paw of the cat, which had not been buried. Somebody had neglected, instantly identified the camp commander's cat. Things got very serious. They mustered the guards and cadre. They came down with guns sidearms and pistols. They lined us all up and they said they were going to kill us all. And one man had a Spartacus moment and he said he did it. And they pulled him out. They beat him severely, kicked him to the ground, kicked him in the head and face, pulled me out, tied me up very tightly, beat me in the face with fists, put the carcass of the cat around my neck, hung me from a hooch for one day, 
then tied me to a tree for the second day with the carcass still around my neck, and boy, was it drawing flies. And the fellow who was beaten so badly died three weeks later. And I was sitting with him. It was middle of the night, and I actually had his head in my arms, and he was wavering in and out of coma and had been for, since the beating. And all of a sudden, and this is the honest God's truth, and I have a witness. He opened his eyes. He focused them. He looked right at me. He said, Mom, Dad, Sis, I love you very much. Box 10, Doubly, Louisiana. <clears throat> Five years later, I sat on the porch in Doubly, Louisiana with his father and drank a beer and told him about his son. And <clears throat> I went from Merrick, Long Island to San Francisco, California when I was on convalescent leave and talked to the families of the men who died. The ones I couldn't talk to, I called on the phone. Finally, <clears throat> after three and a half years and 13 deaths and many close calls with bombs and artillery, in February of 1971, they decided to move us to Hanoi, North Vietnam. We were 12 survivors out of 27, and we were divided into two groups, fast and slow, six and six. I was in the fast group. It took us 57 days to make the 900-kilometer, 540-mile trek to North Vietnam. The slow group took 180 days. For much of the trek, we were shackled, and we slept every night in leg irons. We walked across the DMZ under heavy artillery and... Uh, bombing, and we walked to Vinh, North Vietnam, which was a railroad town, and they put us on a boxcar for the last 180 miles with hundreds of South Vietnamese prisoners who had been captured in a recent operation. On the trick, I had stolen from a clothesline a khaki uniform, pants and shirt, and I'd put it in my sack of rice, which I had carried, and on the train, it took 10 hours, it took 18 hours to go 180 miles. I folded that uniform and I slept on it. And when we got to Hanoi, I put on this, quote, pressed uniform and I used somebody's canteen to comb my hair. And I came out of the train. I wanted to have dignity and bearing. Dignity is the opposite of humiliation. And so they put us in an old French prison, and it was called the Plantation. And it was filled with prisoners. We were six in a room, and the room was windowless. It had a bucket for a latrine. We each slept on individual pallets. We roasted in the summer, and we were cold and damp in the winter. One man got out once a day to empty the latrine bucket. That was it. We ate two identical meals. Each meal was two cups of water one piece of bread, and one small cup of a soup they called pumpkin soup. It was like melon. There was no mail, no books. A single light bulb burned 24-7, and we, the camp radio, we had speakers in the room, and they played propaganda or mu anti-war music through the radio all the time. When there were visitors like Jane Fonda or Pete Seeger or American leftists or communists, they spoke to us through the radio. And I never spoke to them personally. We were forbidden from speaking to any other prisoner outside of our cell. But we had a leader. We had a tap code, and we tapped through the walls to people. And we had a leader that we called Moses that we never saw. But he issued directives to us through the wall, through the tap code. And he was tortured terribly. And we, once in a while, they would put him on the camp radio. And he would tell us to collaborate and to cooperate. But we could tell he was being tortured by his inflection and by his atrocious grammar. And he obviously had very good English. So finally, after three and a half years in the jungle and two years in Hanoi, five and a half years, in December of 1972, for 11 days, Operation Linebacker 2, B-52s bombed Hanoi, bombed the smithereens out of it. And 
though the bombs were very close, we cheered them. Something was happening. And indeed it was because the peace was signed less than a month later, 27 January 1973. We were released in groups. And they uh, came down and they took our uh, prison uniforms and they gave us special clothes. They gave me the glasses you saw in the film, which they must have had a thousand glasses. I'll talk about that at the cocktail party. Uh, and the release clothes were a little short sleeve shirt, a pair of blue pants, some cardboard shoes, and a little gym bag that we call in the service AWOL bag. And we were taken to Jailam Airport. And our Moses, our senior ranking officer, who turned out to be Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Ted Guy from Indiana, who had been terribly tortured for over five years for trying to lead us, lined us up in the shed. Now, we'd been captured five and a half years, over five years, and he said, each man will zip his windbreaker down one-third of the way. You will tuck your shirt tail in. You will carry your AWOL bag in your left arm, and you will march out with bearing and dignity and honor. James Michener asked, where do we get such men? I'd like to know. So you, you saw in the film, um, I went out and I was greeted by the general and he was crying and he called me Major Kushner. I'd been promoted. I didn't even know I'd been promoted. <laughs> but when, when he hugged me, I could feel his thickness and that was something different. It was tactile. It was very different. And we were coming home and our first stop was the Philippines. We got emergency medical care. I got false teeth. Uh, and we were there for three days. We got fitted for uniforms. And then we went to Hawaii for a stop. And I had promised myself in the jungle that if I ever survived, the minute I landed on American soil, I was going to sing aloud, God bless America. And when we landed at Hickam Air Force Base at 2 o'clock in the morning, there were 1,500 people out to greet us, including the press. And I led the group in that song. And even the press joined in. In those days, they didn't have to be neutral. It was different. And I went to Valley Forge General Hospital, which was right down the road in Phoenixville, which is no longer there. And I was in and out of the hospital uh, for four months in a casualty status. I had four surgeries. I was suffering from malnutrition, parasites, malaria, beriberi, lots of other stuff. I reconnected with my family. I met my five-year-old son, Mike, for the first time, my daughter, Tony Jean, who was three and a half when I left and nine and a half when I came back. I went back to duty in August after making a cross-country trip. And I did, the Army was great to me. And I, I did consecutive residencies in internal medicine and ophthalmology. And I retired from the Army Reserve as a colonel. I've been so fortunate I've had a successful practice. I've been very active in my community. I've done missions all over the world. I've never had PTSD or flashbacks. I've recovered from all my wounds, and I have the same stuff any old man has. <laughs> the Buddhists teach us that life is suffering. Viktor Frankl, the Austrian psychiatrist and Auschwitz survivor, wrote a wonderful book, Man's Search for Meaning, which has meant a lot to me says that we should make our suffering meaningful, that we should be worthy of our suffering, and we should use it to help other people. And in, in this winter of my life, I have received many honors and accolades, none more meaningful than two comments by fellow prisoners. Chief Warrant Officer Frank Anton, a helicopter pilot, wrote, uh, Kushner was offered a better life working in a hospital. He refused. He was forbidden to practice medicine, but at great personal risk, he found ways to alleviate suffering and save lives. He never quit. He always attempted to motivate us to keep fighting and keep trying. Another, Sergeant David Harker, said, Captain Kushner never lost his will to practice medicine. He was an angel in hell. In the end, he would simply hold dying prisoners in his arms and saw them through to the other side. I feel I am so honored here. Dr. Haller heard me and she engineered this. 
and I, I'm so grateful, but we must always remember what General Eisenhower said. He said, humility must always be the portion of any man who receives a claim earned in the blood of his followers or the sacrifices of his friends. I am so aware of that, and I am so humbled by the knowledge that if it weren't for my fellow soldiers, I wouldn't have had a great practice. I wouldn't be here. My mom always taught me to look for the good in people and in experience. And I learned there's some good that came from my experience. I learned about confidence in oneself. I learned about loyalty to your country and its ideals and to put your friends and comrades first. No task is too hard if you believe in yourself. So we're supposed to have CME objectives. Those are the CME objectives for this lecture. <laughs> But I can never forget the fine American soldiers in the United States Marines who died in my arms. In October of 2017, just two and a half years ago now, my wife Gail and I sponsored the first and only reunion for our survivors of our band in the South. There are only six of us left now out of 27, actually seven. One guy was a collaborator, he was not invited. But there are three white men and three black men all of us brought our wives, several brought children and grandchildren. So there were 16 of us all. And we had this reunion in a fancy restaurant in Orlando. Each man, each man spoke spontaneously of his love for the others and have, of how none of us would be alive if it hadn't been for all of us. And in this age of pernicious identity politics, I wish the whole country had seen our banquet. Shakespeare had it right, as usual. We band of brothers, for he who sheds his blood with me this day shall be my brother. And indeed, we are brothers, and we are close ones. And he often, Shakespeare knew about veterans, too, because he said, he who survives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when this day is named and strip his sleeve and show his scars. We all have scars, but they're mar lucky marks. They're marks of luck. I know I'm lucky. I'm an American, and I love my country so much. During my captivity, I lost seven teeth, 55 pounds, 16 brothers, and the joy of seeing my children grow. I have no bitterness at all. I'm lucky, and I'm proud and honored that I could serve my country under difficult circumstances and come safe home with even more love and more devotion for this exceptional nation. So thank you for honoring me with this speech. It's a high point of my life. I'm 15 minutes over, but she stole 20 minutes of my time. <laughs>